Hello friends, my name is Ruben Gargalan and I'm founder of Learning Mission Nonprofit Organization. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'll introduce our nonprofit in Armenian and then we'll switch back uh, to English. Varavdes Sireli Harinakitsner, Chach Nurakalan Gur Jamana Ktakiev Miatsak Mizai Sur. Yes, Ruben Gargalan, uh Menkin Nadri Link Learning Mission, Varekorza Kan Kazma Kirkutsuna. Learning mission him not the best patriarchs meets on each other's head. It may cast a sank, which can carry over a mirror skin on an elaborate hazor, IT, more lord. If a mid neighbor make pet carjack sank, mesh ear cream, if elaborate hazor a snake upon dining, IT, more lord. Masna vorapes, make cast a sank for patriarchs meets with a dart at Zimbornera, or on the government shot Sanders, which I can make polar is catch like Neda. Irans Anrajeshte Oknel, Irans Anrajeshte Ajaxel, Tal Irans Huis, Yev Tal Irans Naravorutsun, Integre Vel Mirazarakutsan Mech, Yev Avena Karevora, Terper in Mastan Kitutsun, Yev Terper in Naravorutsun, Kumar Vastakel. Yev Yete is Karo and Sharon again. Canaris volunteered at Ziruben, but in Ranit for Zivornera, Sovereluin, IT Technologiane, Nayev, Irenkus Tanelo in Anglerin. Canibor Angleren lezun shat kapvatze sertore sertoren kapvatze IT technology aneri het IT skpacharov men kiren zoknelueng naev IT benagavarum yev hai kamez oknelue nuin pes vore negatsu me Glendale High School Glendale avag de proci Armenian club yev ireng nuin pes oknelue na jaktelue mez mer gortu. Hello everyone and thank you for attending our virtual event learning mission was founded by, as you know, Ruben Gargalian, immediately after the outcome of the 2020 Artsakh War, when we all realized that it is important now more than ever to invest in our youth and to make our country stronger for the future. And when we also realized that our soldiers who are coming back now, well, they're not really soldiers, they're just young kids between the ages of 18, 20 mostly. And now many of them are coming back without legs, without other limbs, with other difficulties and obstacles that they'll have to face for the rest of their lives. And as you know, it's very difficult for veterans to readjust into civilian life. So that's also going to be very important for them to have some kind of opportunities for their future. So we as Learning Mission decided that we are going to provide quality IT education to these young kids, as well as other affected people in order to help them readjust into our society and also to create a stronger Armenia for tomorrow. Yes, <laughs> Zut kentron anan usum stanalu uremen ait karevosh na patakin. So, in in other words, in English, help us so that we may help our country together. We are going to provide these children, these adolescents, but really, frankly, they are just children, with laptops and internet and everything they need, so that they can focus entirely on their education. So that now we may have more skilled workers in Armenia and more skilled workers, especially in a field as important as IT and as fast growing as IT, so that we can build more powerful and prosperous Armenia for tomorrow. <laughs> Please donate so we may tackle this vitally important issue together. Thank you. Dear friends, please stay tuned for a history lecture on the history of Artsakh by Professor Kawi after these performances. Professor Peter Kawi is a Nadegazi professor of Armenian studies at the University of California, Los Angeles, and has taught at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, the University of Chicago, and Columbia University. His research interests include medieval Armenian history, modern Armenian nationalism, and Armenian film and theater. Professor Kawi is the author of five books and the editor of four others. And now, I would like to introduce our good friend and very talented jazz musician, Fahan Baznuni. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, Happy New Year and Merry Christmas. Since the days that the word in Artsakh started in September of last year, if you are Armenian, chances are you were asking yourself every day what it is that I can do to help the war effort. And many of us did many things that we could, and we tried to do everything that we can in order to help however we can financially through organizing, fundraisers, etc. Now that the war is over, we are asking ourselves another question, and that is what we can do to help the people affected by this effort. And today is a wonderful opportunity to learn about two organizations that are doing just that. And I want to tell you a little bit about it, as you may have already heard. Uh, uh, first organization is High Hopes, and this is a great organization that is helping students displaced by the war. And High Hopes, uh, the mission is to provide equitable and sustainable learning opportunities for displaced youth from the Artsakh war through the technology of remote learning and mobile classrooms. And as you can imagine, people who are displaced in Artsakh right now don't have many opportunities for traditional learning so organizations like this i think are a wonderful opportunity to make up for education for those children and the other organization uh that i want to tell you about today that you have already heard about is learning mission and uh learning mission is focusing on providing education in it to disadvantaged people in Armenia affected by the recent war of Artsakh. Again, another wonderful opportunity to help those people affected. And with that, I want to share a little bit of music with you and hope to inspire you to learn more and contribute whatever you can for this great effort.
Dear friends, our goal for this fundraising is $18,000. And let me explain how we arrived to this amount. We will be maintaining a pilot class that is comprised of 10 students. And each student will be given a laptop, uh, which ranges about $500 to $600. Um, on top of that, we'll need a um, tech support for these laptops. We also will be paying stipend for each student. That will be $50 for first three months. And uh, upon successful passing of a midterm exam, that merely validates they're willing to continue the program and whether they're following the program and they, they grasp the material, uh, the stipend will be doubled and uh, the course will be kind of uh, much more complicated and kind of catered toward uh, getting the final uh, knowledge base for um, IT work and IT occupation. I'd like to mention that those students that will not pass the term exam will, be, uh, will keep their laptops. That will give them gateway to the world. They will be able to explore, explore the world and find themselves and will still be willing to help them to, to find their occupation. I want to mention that uh, this is the minimal amount we can ask for today. And uh, we are not willing to pay at this point to our instructors that uh, kindly express their uh, desire to donate their times. And um, that kind of reduces the amount of money we need to raise today. Later on, upon uh, certif certifying the program and validating the program, make making sure that program works efficiently with this specific social group, uh, we'll be starting, we'll be scaling horizontally and hiring more instructors and, and maintaining more groups. So about $18,000 we need for each group of students, each 10, uh, group of 10 students. Uh, we'll be bringing our site um, up, which will be www.learningmission.com and we'll have complete transparency with our operations. We'll be sharing video material, we'll be sharing um, uh, stories, we'll be sharing our lessons and you will have plenty of information about the progress of, uh, of this uh, initiative. Um, you know, and um, you know, you will be seeing your donations at work. Um, at this point, I think we can easily, together, we can easily materialize that we can make it happen. And I really appreciate your time and your kind donation. We need them today to make a big difference. Thank you very much for tuning in today. I'm sure, uh, we'll talk more. And now, I would like to introduce famous cellist Artsom Manukyan.
Thank you very much.
Now, please welcome our dear friend and family member, Arsen Jamkochan, who is a doctorate student at the University of Eastman, where he is studying piano performance. Thank you. And now, the long-awaited history lecture from UCLA professor Peter Cowie. Enjoy. Hello, I'm Peter Cowie, Naragatsi professor of Armenian studies at UCLA. I support the organizers' initiative in putting together this event, and I'm glad to contribute with a short talk on an area of the Caucasus that's been in the news a lot lately. The international pages of newspapers have been filled with updates on the recent war that concluded on November 10th. That war is an object lesson in the disjunction between geography and demography on the one hand and the organization and structure of the state on the other. Or to put it another way, the self-determination of peoples and the inviolability of international borders. The area I'm going to talk about is Artsakh, the name the region officially bears since February 2017. But it may be familiar to many of you by another name, Nagorno-Karabakh. Here is a map of Southern Caucasia located between the republics of Armenia and Azerbaijan is the area of Nagorno-Karabakh. Demographically, it is a territory with a primarily Armenian population, as you can see on this map, marked by the green area here, while international law fixes it within the borders of Azerbaijan. However, if we look at a relief map of the region, we see that Karabakh e Artsakh marks the northeastern section of the Armenian plateau here. The Russian term Nagorno of the region's name means mountainous and therefore marks a continuation of the upland to its west rather than the plains that stretch out to its east and south. Until today, its uh, mountainous terrain is covered with thick forests, as we can see in the next slide, that were typical of the highland as a whole. The term Karabakh just mentioned, which has designated the region since medieval times, means black orchard and testifies to its rich, fertile soil. To anticipate our conclusions, I'd like to begin by highlighting some of the main characteristics of Artsakh's historical record that spans over two millennia. 
Basically, we can say that there has been a continuous Armenian presence there documented since the second century BCE with its distinctive Karabakh dialect that was governed internally by its own, mobility, own nobility until 1822, most way functioning under the suzerainty of different empires until 1917. Consequently, although the recent war and earlier conflicts between the Armenian community of Nagorno-Karabakh and the government of the Republic of Azerbaijan have been categorized as the result of age-old ethnic tensions or of a religious nature, since Armenians are culturally Christian, while Azerbaijanis belong to either the Sunni or the Shia branches of Islam, as we shall see, the disputes actually began in the early 20th century, in the tradition, in the transition to nationalist republics in Caucasia in 1918, in the aftermath of World War I and the Russian Revolution. Indeed, there are several striking parallels between the events in 1918 to 23 and those of 1987 to 94 that marked the close of the Soviet imperium. Similarly, the first Karabakh war of 1992 to 94 has several features in common with the one that just ended. What is important to grasp here is the fundamental difference between devolved pre-modern multi-ethnic empires that tend not to be very intrusive and thrive on peaceful coexistence and the modern nation state that creates a centralized unified polity that does not favor ethnic diversity or regional pluriformity. Artsakh first appears on the historical radar in Urartian inscriptions of the seventh century BCE that refer to the area as Ardakh and Urdehe. It subsequently passed under Median rule in the mid sixth century and thereafter under the Achaemenian Empire of Iran until the time of Alexander the Great, one of whose generals ushered in a period of Seleucid rule. Thereafter, the Greek writer Strabo describes Artsakh under the name Orchistene as one of the provinces of Greater Armenia that was governed directly by the Ardashesid or Artaxian dynasty from 189 BCE. The most illustrious representative of that ruling family was Dikram II, who reigned from circa 95 to 55 BCE. He carved out a vast, if short-lived empire extending from the Caspian to the Mediterranean seas. He constructed a new capital for his realm in Tikranokerta in the region of Lake Van, but also built an Eastern counterpart in Artsakh that has been systematically excavated since 2005 by my colleague, Hamlet Petrosian. And here in the slide, we see an element of the city wall that has been excavated. Armenia has become known as the first Christian nation, its royal court accepting the religion in the early fourth century. According to the author Agathangelos, the prince of Artsakh was one of 16 nobles who accompanied St. Gregory the Illuminator on his way to be consecrated bishop of the region. Later in the fourth century occurred one of the most crucial watersheds in the history of Artsakh. By the peace of Akelisene that we see on the slide of 387, culminating about 20 years of warfare between greater Armenia and Iran, the Armenian provinces of Artsakh and Udik were reassigned to the neighboring kingdom of Caucasian Albania which had been a Persian ally in the war. This change had radical consequences, both for the province and the state. 
the Armenian presence there helped develop the Caucasian Albanian polity. Artsakh contained some of the most important cities in the country, so much so that the capital moved to one of them called Bartav, which you see here marked on the map, by the very end of the fourth century. The next century saw the rise of the Prince of Artsakh, Vachen, who played a significant role in international politics. In the mid seventh century, Southern Caucasia as a whole passed from the suzerainty of Sasanian Iran into that of the Arab Caliphate, created under the impetus of Muhammad and the new religion of Islam. Caucasian Albania continued within that structure until the demise of its Mihranid dynasty in circa 821-22, after which local government in the territory passed to a number of smaller statelets. From this point until the mid 13th century, two of the smaller states controlling the area of Artsakh were Khachen in the north and Disag in the south. First as principalities, and then from around uh, the early 11th century as kingdoms. Thus, Hofanes Senekerim acquired the royal title in Khachen around the year 1000. The kingdom's most prestigious period emerged in the 13th century under the powerful house of Hassan Jalalyan. Among other construction projects they undertook was the founding of the impressive monastery of Gansasar, you see on the slide, uh, built on a high mountain peak, the construction of which lasted from 1216 to 1238. It later served as the seat of the Catholicos, uh, a supreme patriarch of Caucasian Albania. Hassan Jalal Daula is portrayed as the quintessential Christian monarch by the Armenian historian Giragos of Ganja uh, in the following terms. I quote, a pious and God-loving man, mild, merciful, and a lover of the poor, unquote. Indeed, he traveled several times to Karakorum, the capital of the Mongol Empire, to secure tax relief for his community. On his death in 1261, the heirs of the two sections of Artsakh, Khachen in the north and Dizag in the south, married, uh, thus reuniting the area as the principality of Khachen. This polity maintained local autonomy until the suzerainty of the Turkmen federations of the Karakuyunlu, black sheep in the 14th century, and the Akkuyunlu, the white sheep, in the 15th. In time, the Hassan Jalalian house of Khachen fragmented, giving rise to two further branches. The Melik Beklarian family in the area of Gulistan, which we see in the north, and the Melik Israelian family of Jurabert um, next to it. These were then joined by the Melik Shah Nazarian family of Varanda for the south, and Melik Avanyan family of Dizak in the south. Together, these formed the five Melikdoms of Karabagh that were to gain greater fame and prominence in later centuries. The 16th century marked the return of a strong dynasty unifying the lands of Iran in the form of the Safavids, under whom the mountainous and plain areas of Karabakh were combined into one distinct vilayet or province, one of the largest in the empire, with a center in the city of Ganja under a governor or Beklar Beg, the first of whom, Piri Beg Kachar, was appointed in 1501. These centralizing developments in Ram, on the eastern part of the historic Armenian homeland, were matched by major advances in the west, 
as the Ottoman sultans Selim and Suleiman I incorporated all the traditionally Armenian territories around Lake Van under their rule in a systematic series of campaigns from the 1520s onwards. These innovations provoked a response on the part of the Armenian ecclesiastical and secular elites in inaugurating a movement to revive the Armenian monarchy that had been intercepted by the Mamluk capture of Cilicia in 1375. This was to be achieved with the aid of the papacy and the European kings, and the Meliks of Karabakh played a role in this initiative, and the main uh, representatives of the Armenian aristocracy, deploying a number of embassies, culminating in that of Israel Ori, we see on the slide, um, that um, uh, introduced the situation to Peter the Great at the turn of the 18th century. The process it set in motion ultimately led to the Russian annexation of Transcaucasia in 1828. Meanwhile, in the mid 18th century, Iran reconstituted the province of Karabakh into the more autonomous Khanate of Karabakh, as before embracing the mountainous sector of the five Armenian Meliks together with the plain, mainly inhabited by a Turkmen Muslim population whose numbers demographically dominated the Khanate. Moreover, the first incumbent uh, Pana Ali Khan Javanshir quickly consolidated power over the five Meliks and later expanded his rule over the southern regions of Armenia. During the years 1750 to 52, the Khan constructed a new city, Panahabad, that bore his name, which was later renamed Shusha and was to become the largest city in the Khanate. The loyalty of the Armenian population to the Khan was amply proved during an attack in 1795, in which Armenians fought alongside the Turkmen to expel the invader. At the same time, the Meliks' parallel alignment with Russia resulted in Tsar Paul's signing a charter on June 2nd, 1799, that placed the Armenians of Karabakh formally under Russian protection. The pace of events quickened over the first two decades of the 19th century, when the whole Khanate of Karabakh was annexed by Russia as ratified by the Treaty of Bulistan of 1813. Nine years later, the Khanate was abolished uh, as an administrative unit. A census conducted the following year registered the population in the estates of the five Meliks as 90.8% Armenian. By 1828, all of Southern Caucasia found itself under Russian rule, which was streamlined by 1844 by the appointment of a viceroy responsible directly to the Tsar for the conduct of affairs. Thoroughly integrated into the Russian Empire, the area of Nagorno-Karabakh made significant contributions to the state, particularly in the military domain. Thus, the Eastern Front of the Russo-Turkish War of 1877-78 was under the command of four Armenian generals, two of whom, uh, whose images we see here, Ivan Lazarev and Boris uh, Shalkovnikov were aristocrats from Karabakh. In 1868, the region was reconstituted as the Elizabethpol Governate, uh, which comprised the lands of the former Iranian Khanates of Ganja in the north, Shaki in the middle, and Karabakh in the south. A census of 1897 reveals that the Tatars, a term then designating Azerbaijanis, constituted 60.8% of the overall population, 
while the Armenians made up 33.3%, being the majority only in one of the eight subdivisions of the gubernia, that of Shusha. Under the impact of Armenian nationalism and taking advantage of the atmosphere of the first Russian revolution of 1905, the Armenian community in the mountainous region initiated steps to detach it from the rest of the governorate, um, which was to lead to greater consequences after the main Bolshevik revolution of 1917. Although in the immediate aftermath, a short-lived joint Transcaucasian uh, de Democratic Federative Republic was formed, it split quickly into three nationalist republics, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia, in May 1918, rendering the Armenians' concerns more concrete as opposition escalated into armed conflict during the Republic's two-year life. The Azerbaijani position argued that the mountainous region did not represent a neat administrative unit, but straddled two, Ganja and Karabakh. Uh, moreover, many of the Tatar inhabitants of the plains were actually semi-nomadic, moving their flocks up to the mountain pastures in summer and back down to the plains in winter, so that the Armenians' proposal would undermine the no nomads' lifestyle. Meanwhile, almost all the roads in the region led to the east, not to the Armenian Republic in the west from which they concluded that the proposed mood would be unjust. To this, the Armenians responded that Azerbaijani rule would be unacceptable to them in view of the discrimination and violation of their rights that they had suffered under the Tatars in the past. Events unfolded swiftly after that. On July 1918, the first Armenian assembly of Nagorno-Karabakh declared the region autonomous and created a national council and government. Meanwhile, on January 15, 1919, the Azerbaijani government proclaimed the territory's annexation and appointed Khosrov Beg Sultan as the governor general of Karabakh. Soon after, the Armenian National Council of February 1919 declared the region an integral part of Armenia and an Armenian revolt of March 1920 led to bitter reprisals against the Armenian population of Shusha later in the month. Complexities continued as Azerbaijan and Armenia entered the nascent Soviet Union in the following year. The Kav Bureau, the Caucasian Bureau of the Communist Party, charged with uh, organizing affairs in Transcaucasia, decided to integrate Nagorno-Karabakh into the Armenian Republic on July 4th, 1921, but reversed its decision on the intervention of Joseph Stalin later in the month. Ultimately, in a ruling of July 7th, 1923, the body determined that Nagorno-Karabakh should remain formally within the Azerbaijani Republic, but should be granted broad regional autonomy, its borders being drawn to include Armenian villages, but largely to exclude those with an Azerbaijani population. This became the Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Oblast with an administrative center in the city of uh, Khan Kendi, the name of which was soon changed to Stepanagerd, uh, in honor of the Armenian revolutionary Stepan Shalmyan. Nevertheless, in the succeeding decades, the region was not permitted the autonomous self-government its status required, and Baku was charged with a deliberate attempt to expand the Azerbaijani population in the region to diminish the Armenian majority. This decline is certainly borne out uh, by census figures. While the Armenian population in 1926 represented 89.2%, by 1920,
by 1989, that number had fallen to 76.9%. Consequently, under the freedom of speech, glasnost, uh, granted by the Gorbachev government of the USSR, in August 1987, the Nagorno-Karabakh Armenians sent a petition to Moscow with 80,000 signatures applying for the region's transfer from Azerbaijani jurisdiction to that of the Armenian Soviet Republic. Lack of response led to large-scale demonstrations by the Nagorno-Karabakh Armenians in Stepanagerd in February 1988. That in turn resulted in a massacre of the Armenian population in the industrial center of Sumgait and later in the Azerbaijani capital of Baku. Subsequently, on November 26, 1991, the Azerbaijani parliament dissolved the oblast's autonomous status and redistributed its territory among neighboring regions. This provoked the Nagorno-Karabakh Armenian population to declare the oblast um, an independent republic of Nagorno-Karabakh. Tensions then escalated into the First Karabakh War of 1992 to 94, in which Russia intervened on both sides. Azerbaijan was assisted strategically by Turkey and gained ground support from Mujahideen fighters from Afghanistan and Chechnya and mercenaries from Iran, while the Armenian forces were augmented by volunteers from different diaspora uh, communities. By the end of the war, the army of the Armenian Republic and the Nagorno-Karabakh Defense Force controlled around 12% of Azerbaijani territory in the south and west outside Nagorno-Karabakh properly, as we can see on this map. Here the area of Akhdam, uh, Fizuli, Jibrail, Lachin, and Kalbajar. Hostilities were terminated only with a ceasefire, not a formal treaty between the parties. However, under the umbrella of the Minsk Group of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, overseen by the USA, France, and Russia, representatives of the Armenian and Azerbaijani republics met periodically over the next years to try to resolve the outstanding issues while the government of the Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh, though lacking international recognition, became the de facto administrator of the territory. Meanwhile, Azerbaijan continued its economic blockade of Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh and was active in bolstering its position through diplomacy in various international fora. This had the effect of leveraging a number of condemnations of the Armenian side, such as the UN General Assembly's call on March 14, 2008, for an immediate unconditional Armenian withdrawal from the occupied territories, and a pronouncement by the European Parliament of 20th May 2010 that the Armenian occupied territories should be cleared. Nevertheless, Frustrated by the lack of diplomatic progress, Azerbaijan increasingly turned to the military option, initiating the four-day war at the beginning of April 2016, which resulted in the acquisition of several kilometers of territory of strategic importance on heights overlooking Nagorno-Karabakh. Another warning sign was the brief Azerbaijani attack targeting the northern Armenian province of Daush in July of last year, before the outbreak of the full-scale war in September across the complete extent of the, contract, of the contact line with Artsakh. The second Karabakh war featured Turkish intervention like the first, but now on a much larger scale, not only providing logistical support, but drones and other armaments 
strategic oversight of operations, and the mobilization of Islamic terrorists from the sector of Syria uh, Turkey controls. This involvement is characteristic of the Turkish President Recep Erdogan's neo-Ottoman policies in Libya, Syria, and the Eastern Mediterranean, which is now seen as challenging uh, Russia's hegemony in the broader region. While the focus of Armenia and Artsakh provided strong resistance along the mountainous area, uh, the opposing uh, army gradually made headway across the plains to the south, from which direction they entered the territory of Artsakh as far as the city of Shushi. This led to the signing of a ceasefire in November 9th. The war resulted in several thousand casualties and a much larger number of displaced persons on both sides. And the heavy bombing of Stepanagerd and areas around Ganja. The terms of the ceasefire required the Armenian side to return all the remaining occupied territories taken in 1994. A 2000 strong force of Russian peacekeepers was deployed in the Lachin corridor with an initial mandate of five years to permit transport between Armenia and Artsakh, while a new road is to be constructed across the southern Armenian province of Sunik to provide access between the Azerbaijani territory of Nakhichivan and the main part of the Republic, also under Russian oversight. The whole region is in urgent need of humanitarian support and rebuilding the infrastructure on both sides will take many years and cost several billion dollars. It is much too early to discern what the longer term outcome of the war will be. Russia's unilateral intervention to broker the ceasefire calls into question the future role of the OSCE Minsk Group in supervising the negotiation process in Southern Caucasia. Similarly, the result of the conflict has been perceived as a defeat in Armenia and has caused widespread confusion and immediate calls for the resignation of the Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan. This will lead to a general election within the next few months to obtain a popular mandate for Armenia's future political direction. Meanwhile, Azerbaijan is weighing up the costs of demining and the development of the southern and western territories. What is clear at the moment is Turkey's emergence as a more important power in the region. While Russia has advanced its agenda in reasserting its position as the successor of the Soviet Union in Southern Caucasia, having annexed the areas of Abkhazia and Southern Ossetia, Abkhazia and Southern Ossetia there, in its war with Georgia in 2008, it now has troops uh, on the ground in Azerbaijan and uh, therefore has acquired more potential leverage in that Republic, as well as maintaining its economic and defensive agreement with Armenia. At the same time, from our perspective, what emerges most significantly with regard to Artsakh is the tremendous resilience of the Armenian community there. Characterized by this image, we are our mountains, the symbol of Artsakh's distinctive identity. Severed from Armenia back in uh, the year 387, it has been able to preserve its identity, language, and distinctive culture for over a millennium and a half, and to insist on its rights to self-determination for over a century. The presence of the Russian peacekeeping troops affords Artsakh a certain security 
with which to begin the long process of rebuilding. Assistance of the Armenian Republic and the Armenian worldwide diaspora will facilitate those measures. The way ahead will not be easy, but the polity has survived and the collective has much historical memory to draw upon in considering the path ahead. I hope this overview has been useful in encouraging you to learn more about this fascinating part of the world. Let me end by wishing you all a very happy new year. In Bahrami and Kirsch, Zaragravuruf Ruben Gargaloyan and Ahazernele Mi Pailun Gorzan Tats. Paregorzakan Mihim Nadram Borokochme Learning Mission. Ambochna Pataka Hashmadam Darzats Haizin Vornerin Apahovel Ashatankov, so it's Nelneran Stragravurum, so it's Nelneran's Ashatel Jamanaka Kits, IT Mijots Nerov Ashatel Pohiev Linel Liarjek. Հասարակության անդամ ոչ եմ անում բոլորին հնարավորինը սաջակցել եւ մասնակցել այս փայլուն նախաձեռնությանը Dear friends and now let me introduce you my good old friend Vartan Mamikonyan who is world renowned pianist classical pianist who lives in Paris France he will play some wonderful Chopin pieces for you tonight thank you Now, dear friends, we have the pleasure of introducing Rafael Avetisian, who was a commander in this Artsakh war and who fought bravely to defend our homeland. We also have the pleasure to announce that two of the soldiers who served under him will be taking part in our learning mission pilot program. Hi, friends. The education in Armenia is crucial and the most important thing for the development of the nation. I know two organizations like High hopes and learning mission, which could really contribute a lot to this. I believe in them a lot. And please help them and donate. I'm going to play an etude from Frédéric Chopin.
Hello everyone and thank you for attending our virtual fundraiser tonight. I'd like to give my special thanks to Ms. Asrik Vartanyan of Hike Project. Uh, thank you so much. We couldn't have done this thank without you. you. Thank you very much. And also, Professor Peter Cowie of UCLA, your lecture was absolutely fascinating. Stunning. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor. And also to all of our performers with their stellar performances. Bartha uh, Mamikonyan, Artem Manukyan, Vahan Vaznuni, Arsen Jankuchan. Fantastic. Thank you very much for donating you. your time to us. And uh, also our friends at High Hopes, uh, which is another educational organization you guys should check out. Great one. Uh, especially Vacha Sipanyan. Thank you for helping us put together these videos. And please check out our Instagram and Facebook pages and remember to donate. That's Thank Learning you. Mission Armenia for Facebook and Instagram. And also for emails, please use info at learningmission.com email address and we'll be glad to respond with details of our uh, operations. Thank you so much again. Have Thank you for your donations. Day. Thank you for your donations. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.